Hey what is up guys and welcome back to Predatory Exotics. Today we are going to be giving you a breeding guide for our wedge snouted skinks. The latter name for this species is Chalcides sepsoides. They're a species of almost legless lizard, they have very tiny limbs. This is because they're actually a fossorial species, meaning they're, they're spending most of their time underground. So we're going to talk about the setup that we use to keep them. We're going to be talking about how we have successfully bred two clutches of these skinks now. Um, we believe we're doing a lot of the correct things. We don't know exactly because there's a lot of controversial information on the internet about this species. Um, but, believe, but we believe we've dialed in some of the more finer tuned stuff. Um, and that is why they're successfully breeding. So we're going to talk about the setup, what f we're feeding them, how they grow, how you can identify different males and females. Um, and we're going to tell you as much as we can to help you if you do have this species and you want to breed them in the future. So before we know what kind of setup you're going to need, you're going to need to know where they're from in the wild. So they're actually from northern Africa and parts of the Middle East. So they're very hot, dry, they're going to be in the sand dune type environment. But what we've actually found out is they prefer a more sandy soil rather than straight sand. This is because where they'd live in the wild would be in amongst the vegetation on the sand dunes. So that vegetation is going to be holding the sand dunes together a little bit more. It's going to be possibly a little bit more moist because of the vegetation there. So that's why we use a sandy soil mix. Uh, we personally use Arcadia Earth Mix Arid, which is a great desert soil. We mix that 50-50, about a 10 litre bag to about sort of 15 kilograms worth of sand. We mix that all together and we come up with this consistency. Um, it works really well and then we spray it down a couple times a week. Uh, we mix up the substrate as well. That means the humidity gets trapped inside the soil but the top will dry out as it's such hot temperatures in there. Um, we believe this is great, it's worked so far perfectly and we haven't had any shedding issues with them as well. So they must be getting correct humidity, hydration um, and hopefully this substrate is the perfect mix. So you're going to be spiking that humidity a couple times a week but also you're going to keep that humidity inside the substrate a little bit if they do choose to go down there. Obviously you're going to have your hot spot as well on one side of the enclosure. That's going to dry out a lot quicker than the other side. So we actually set our temperatures to around 37, 38 degrees. So some people say anywhere up to 42 degrees you can put them. Um, we set it to about 38 on a raised basking spot. Um, we have lots of rainbow slate. This absorbs the heat. Um, and when we temp gun it, even though it's set to about 38 degrees, uh, it raises up to about 40 degrees Celsius. So that heat is going to be trapped inside the rock and then it's going to radiate, radiate out afterwards um, with our Arcadia deep heat projector. So that's going to absorb into the rock so they're going to get heat from above as well as below once that rock radiates out the heat. I believe this is super important, especially for gravid females. I've noticed they come out in the evening and they'll bask on top of that rock for a good 30 minutes, um, just absorbing as much heat as they can, possibly to incubate the babies they have inside them. Um, so definitely a must have if you're looking into breeding wedge snouted skinks. Not only will the females bask, but the males will bask and so will the babies. We've noticed all of them climb up to the top at some point. Even though they're a fossorial species, so they're going to be spending most of the time underground, they will occasionally come out and even climb. Sometimes they'll climb up this rock, uh, even try and climb on the branch, but they have tiny little limbs, so they're not very good climbers. They pretty much just slide themselves up onto the top of that rock, um, and then when a predator, i.e. me, comes along, they'll slide back into the sand and avoid predators. So I mentioned males and females will go onto the rock. How do you tell the difference between a male and a female? It's notoriously difficult with pretty much all skinks to tell which one is male and female. Uh, the only way that we've really been able to tell is because the female is a little bit larger. It's probably about 25% larger than the males we have inside the enclosure. Um, and she does get very fat when she's gravid. Um, and she's the only one that has produced babies for us. So we think we have one female and three males inside the enclosure. And um, there's nothing to suggest that the males have a rivalry. There's never any damage to any of the males. And there's en never any damage to the female either. You think with some species, um, more males to one female uh, might be a little bit aggressive to competition with males also breeding the female but we haven't witnessed any aggression between the species and they get on pretty well and no damage has been done. 
Most of the copulation is underground because it's a fossorial species, but sometimes you can witness um, two of the skinks sort of trying to wrap themselves up against each other. Um, this will happen sometimes on the surface, uh, just below the surface, so you can see two skinks together. Um, we can only assume this is breeding behaviour and courtship, but we're not too sure because they are a very mysterious species as they spend a lot of time underground. So wedge snouted skinks actually live bearing skinks. Um, they give birth. We've had one clutch of four, which was the first clutch we've had, and one clutch of five. So they are live bearing. So one day you'll just find loads of baby skinks inside your enclosure. This is obviously fascinating to watch as you see a big pregnant female one day, you're waiting a while, you don't know when they're going to drop, and then one day you'll just see tiny little heads poking out, or they'll be scampering around the surface. Um, it's really cool to find, and then you have to go through and collect them all. So originally, with the original four that we got, we kept them in with the adults. We didn't see anything wrong with that. Um, we fed them a lot of a variety of different sized prey, so the babies would get some as well as the adults. Um, but then after about two months, we noticed one of the males attacking one of the babies. Um, and nothing happened, it was okay. But it's at that point we decided to separate the babies. Um, so that's why we have a second tank next to our large tank. That is for all the babies we get. So we don't want that to happen again. Uh, any rivalry or if the adults attack the babies, we get them separated. So we have two separate tanks. That way we can have our breeding adults in one and all the babies in another one that's safe and protected. So it seems to work pretty well. We've got the 60 long by 45 deep by 30 high. Um, this is enough space for the four adults that we keep as they don't need a lot of climbing room as they barely get up onto the basking spot. They wouldn't do any climbing. They are mostly fossorial um, or terrestrial species. And then for the babies, we have a 45 centimeter low. So it's 45, 45 by 30 high. Again, we don't need that height because of them not being able to climb. So I mentioned heat, but we're gonna talk about light now. Uh, it's somewhat controversial because they come from a very hot area where they're exposed to the sun a lot. It's a very high UVB, um, but they don't really utilize a lot of it because they are fossorial species. So we've put a 12% Arcadia to replicate that Northern Africa, Middle East sun beating down, but they rarely use it. Obviously they will bask on top of the basking spot and get some UVB. Um, and they will go onto the surface partially covered by the sand, but they will be absorbing some of that UV radiation uh, in the gaps that are visible. So it's best to put one on. Um, you're definitely gonna need at least a 6%, um, but we've gone with that 12% just to make sure they're getting enough and we haven't had any problems. We feed them all their minerals and their D3, as well as that UVB, and they seem to be perfectly healthy. So they're getting all those nutrients from the powders, but what are we actually feeding our wedge-snouted skinks? They have a staple diet of mealworms, so the adults get a lot bigger mealworms that get sprinkled amongst the enclosure, that way that they have to hunt for their prey. They crawl around inside the sand and the adults will hunt for them. And this is good enrichment and it's very naturalistic to what it would be like in the wild. And then the babies get exactly the same, but smaller mealworms. So we feed mini mealworms to the adults. And then in the mini mealworm pack, they obviously are in a range of sizes. And then we pick out the very smallest ones to feed to the babies. Obviously, fresh babies are going to need pretty much freshly hatched mealworms, ranging up in size and getting bigger as, to, as they reach adulthood. We've also tried them on a range of other insects. Um, crickets seem to be a little bit too quick for them. They're not very coordinated because they don't have legs. So they do enjoy chasing them, but it's very hard for them to catch. We've also tried locusts, which are a great alternative because they're a little bit slower. They jump, but they walk slower, so they can catch them, but they do tend to climb up the enclosure where the wedge snouted skinks can't get them. So it is all right as long as they're on the bottom. Um, that is also an alternative food source. For the babies, we've tried recently uh, bean weevils. These will dig in the substrate and walk along the top and especially the smaller babies can easily catch them and they're a nice small prey item that you can feed to all your babies and it means they get a lot more nutrition and it means a little bit of enrichment because they crawl around a little bit faster than the mealworms. So the babies tend to grow quite quickly. Um, we had two clutches, one of four and then one of five. Unfortunately in our second clutch there was a runt that died um, so we ended up with four and four. We currently have the four and four um, but we're gonna be rehoming them soon and they grow quite quickly so we've had one clutch that is about two months old and then one clutch that is about five months old 
um, and the adult ones and the bigger ones from that are almost the same size as the adult males that we have in our enclosure. So you're looking at around six months to them almost reaching adult size and within a year they are going to be pretty much adult size. Obviously they are going to grow at different rates um, and the female is going to be slightly larger so you are going to have to wait maybe a year or two before they start breeding. So in conclusion they are a very cool species to keep but breeding might not necessarily be easy um, mainly for the factors that it's hard to distinguish between a male and female so you are going to have to make sure you get a big enough group that you have males and females in it. Um, you can separate them if need be into two separate groups but luckily with the four we got we managed to get a male and female amongst the four um, so it worked out perfectly and then one of the other critical factors I believe is the substrate uh, and actually spraying it more than you would think uh, for a desert species I see a lot of people keep it on straight sand and don't do any misting but I don't think any of these people have had great success so I think the sand soil mix and with some occasional spraying um, actually replicates the wild a lot more and I think that is what entices them to breed and we again the two successful clutches that we've had in this setup and they're going really well and the babies are kept under the exact same conditions and I think that is why they're being raised so perfectly. So if you have enjoyed this video please leave a like, comment down below and don't forget to subscribe here as well as over on Instagram to see all the daily updates on all our different animals as well as these wedge snouted skinks. They're an awesome unique species, they're rarely seen in the hobby so we'd like to see more people keep them. Uh, completely fascinating, something a little bit different. So I hope you've enjoyed seeing a slightly different species to what you would usually see. And don't forget to leave that like and we'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.